What's going on, everybody? It's Ron Brown, LMT, the People's Fitness Professional, alongside my co-host, Mikey Fever. And this oh. is a New Yorker's perspective. We're back again with the guard, uh, La Kim Shabazz, also uh, K Born, K Born. You guys, we brought on today, um, uh, legendary hip hop in the building right now with Lord K Born with Raps New Generation, and we have uh, uh, La Kim Shabazz, uh, from where are you from, God? I'm Jersey, originally right? from North New Jersey, God. North New Jersey, North New Jersey. That's peace. So, La Kim Shabazz, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for just. You you know you answered just like yeah I get on right in the right away like it wasn't no problem like I, I I respect that thank you for that um let's go into the questions I want to ask first somebody's on on the on the feedback somebody has feedback on on this on that thing uh it's probably um let me see. all right yeah that was that was Mikey Fever all right so God, I want to ask some questions let's start off with first. Uh, you from you from Newark, New Jersey, okay? Yes. And um, where'd you get knowledge? Where, you know, where'd you get knowledge? Who was your enlightener or educator? My educator name is Lamel Bourne. He's actually my cousin. Uh, the knowledge hit the streets out here in Newark in the early '80s by way of brothers uh, incarcerated coming out and teaching here and there throughout the streets. And uh, I used to run behind my cousin Lamel. And he began to teach me supreme mathematics and alphabet when I was knowledge understanding. Like I was uh, transitioning from the eighth to the ninth grade. And that put me on my journey right there. All right. That's peace, God. So knowledge understanding for the viewers who don't know. Knowledge understanding. 13 years old. 13 years old. So 13. at that, now at that time. You know that was uh, what 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 was the date at that time? What was it? It was 19 what? 83. 1983. Build understanding. Yep. Indeed. So now around that time in Newark, New Jersey, what was going on? I mean, what kind of influence did the gods have at that time in Newark, New Jersey? Well, at that time in Newark, um, a lot of what was going on, the people, the younger generation was embracing hip hop, you know, the whole hip hop lifestyle. So that had a lot to do with, you know, the guards showing up out in North at that day and time. You know, um, the people were just, uh, what I could say really was embracing hip hop, you know, learning more about the culture of hip hop. A lot of people had started embracing rap, break dancing. We was already DJing. We had a lot of DJ crews out here in North. We used to call it disco music. Then they turned it to club music. Now it's called house music. I grew up. Uh, doing that. Before I ever picked up a microphone, I was on two techniques, spinning music. And actually, that's how I met my DJ, the God C. Just. I met him DJing. And uh, him and my cousin Lamel is the first ones that convinced me to write a rhyme. And I did it. They were impressed. And I've been rhyming ever since. Yet I got into it DJing. Now, um, I'm going to go through your, your catalog real quick. But before I do, I just have a, a question here. I noticed like on a lot of your 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 albums, you talk a lot about like um you reference a lot of I would say like Farrakhan, Africa, and things like and things of that nature. Now coming from the five percent nation, the way I grew up, you know, especially dealing with the seventh degree and the one to fourteen, you know, um Africa is like a misnomer, if you will. We don't necessarily really use Africa, the name, and we don't really advocate, I would say, the African, you know what I'm saying, culture, if you will, right? Because we keep it within the laws of math, the laws world manifest. Right, but exactly. You, but, you, but you reference a lot of Africa. You reference a lot of Farrakhan. It, was that just the climate? the social climate in, in in the 80s? Right, exact. Well, those were, I referenced the things I referenced because they were influential to me at that day and time. And, you know, I was still young in the knowledge in that day and time. And, you know, 
one of the best things about our principles is that understanding comes in time. So at that day and time on my albums, I was referencing Africa because it was a real strong, positive African movement going on, not only just in uh in the streets and in uh in America, but definitely in the hip hop culture. See, I came out around the time of your public enemies, your KRS ones, your ex clans, and all of them. And uh the African culture had a lot of influence, not to intertangle that with what uh the nation of gods and earth represent. However, I was still young in the knowledge. So a lot of things that I referenced, I still had to grow to have a, a clearer understanding on it. Yet I was teaching the people what I had. That's all that was, God. Makes sense. Makes sense. That's mm-hmm. peace, God. That is that is peace. So now uh take me, take me through uh, you know, a walk through Newark, New Jersey and, and 1983. I mean, how did you, you said you got knowledge from your cousin, correct? Yes. Now so My how cousin did that, La born. So how did that come about? Did La Melbourne go like God, you need to you need you the you the God, you the black man. Black man is God. No, well, act, actually, what happened? Uh, we had went to visit this other brother named Iz that my cousin Lamel used to hang with, and we were in the projects down in uh French Street projects down in North. And my cousin Lamel took out a marker and he wrote on the wall five percent of the black man is God, not to advocate you know vandalizing or nothing like that. But keep in mind, it's still the early 80s, and we embracing the hip hop culture. That, that the graffiti, break dancing, rapping, so on and so forth. And the nation, a lot of the uh, brothers from the nation that were out there came by way of these little hip hop events. Anyway, um, my brother, uh, my cousin had wrote on the wall, 5% of the black man is gone. So I looked at it and I asked him what that's about. I told him, I'm a black man. That means that I'm the God. He said, yeah, you the God, but there's things you got to study and things of that nature. And that's what led me on my way from right there. Once he wrote 5% of the black man is God on the wall, I looked at myself right there at 13, like, hold up, I'm a black man. That's talking about me. He's like, yeah. You know, and he started teaching me from there. I just wanted to be like my cousin LaMel at the time. I ain't really had no understanding of what I was getting into. Understood. Understood. So before you get, came into the knowledge of yourself, were you, did you come from a Christian household, a Islamic household? Islam. Uh, my uncle were a member of the Nation of Islam. Uh, my mother never fed us any swine. I'm grateful for that. I went to church a couple of times with my grandmother, but for the most part, uh, yeah, it's a heavy Islamic background, heavy nation Islam background. My uncle Mustafa was a member of the nation Islam, and my uncle Raheem was a member of the nation Islam. So that that makes a lot of sense, you know, where you have in your your catalog a lot of kind of like uh, nation of Islam references too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you were influenced by the nation of Islam as well given that your family was a part of the Nation of Islam. Definitely. I uh, had a heavy influence from the Nation of Islam in my younger years, you know, definitely. All right. All right. Now, so how did how did your cousin give you the, the, the knowledge? Did he give it to you, like, with he get started you off with the math? Did, you, did he start you off with the law's history? I no, mean, he started did... teaching me supreme mathematics. My cousin, Lamel, um, he didn't really have a lot of history of Allah. I didn't start learning about Almighty God Allah two years later after he started teaching me. And we met uh, the God, uh, the brother named Jamel Shabazz from Medina. Actually, uh, I went to my first rally in Medina with my cousin Lamel. And that's who we had linked up with, the brother Jamel Shabazz that take the photos in the nation. Uh, we had linked up with him in the early 80s, and that put us on our journey. We actually got our first set of 120 through him. Hmm. Through Jamel Shabazz. Yep. Brother named Jamel Shabazz. Uh, he's take, he takes a lot of photos. He's recorded a lot of history in the nation. A lot of history. All right. All right. So so now you got, you got uh, the whole 120 and everything like that now. How were the gods at that time in just new now justice in, in New Jersey? Like, 
Was it like a wave, like it was in New York City? I, I would imagine so, right? Because New York City is right next to now Justice. So yes, God. I mean, um, it was the same, man. Like uh Newark didn't have a lot of guards at that time. It was sprinkled out in different sections. However, there were other cities in the state of New Jersey where there was a very large guard presence, like Patterson, a lost paradise, of course, Asbury Park, just cross, just the sea, because that's right across the water. So, you know, it was flourishing out here, definitely. All right, so uh, I mean, you know, in and now in Mecca, of course, we got the, a law school, and now Justice at that time, what was like the meeting place? Different parks. We would have uh, rallies at uh, Irvington Park. Uh, years later, we would have rallies at uh, what's that? Weekway Park, and then some brothers would have like house parliaments here and there, you know. So there was, you know, in uh, in Medina, they there was a school out there at one time as well. So it was a school yes. in Medina, a school in a, a Mecca, and uh, in an oasis or Queens or the desert. Um, I think they had something going on out there, and then it fell off. I don't know exactly what happened because I'm not from out there. But they from got one in Brownsville. You said what? They got one in Brownsville. Right. I don't know if that one is still there though anymore. They're still there, but I think they closed. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know they had a school in Medina. Uh, to yeah. my understanding, there was one out in uh, the desert as well, the oasis. Yeah. And of course, we had a root of civilization in Mecca, you know. Right, 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 right. Yeah, we used to go so, out to Long Island or uh, Roosevelt back in the days, too. And and they had a, uh, mm. in Patterson, an old project that, that was all uh, full of guards in Patterson. Yeah, in Patterson, uh, in the early 80s, there was a lot of guards in Patterson, also <laughs> in Plainfield. Power Force, whole, Trenton as well. Mm -hmm. They had a whole project out there in Patterson that wasn't too, uh, too far from a football stadium. And we used to go out there and hang out with all the guards in the earth. And they was deep. Yes, yes. Uh, the Godfather, Nation, a lot of brothers out there. You mentioned that name, it rings bells out in Patterson, definitely. You know, the guards was heavy in Patterson in the 80s, and they still are to this day, definitely. Mm -hmm. And so, and now Justice, so I, I, I we spoke about the schools in Mecca, or and now and now and now why? But what about the school in in now Justice? So no schools, just park. Now Cipher, no, nah, we never established the guards. Never established no school, at least not here in uh in North in this day and time. Uh, in conjunction with Mayor Raz Baraka. The guard elevation is a part of what he has uh, built, the Newark Street Academy. And what that does is they deal with disengaged youth from the ages of, I say like from about 16 to 21, re-engage them back into society. The, the name came directly from the Street Academy in New York. And uh, basically just living out of Law's vision, man. Law's vision was to to revive the youth back to life, God, keeping our focus on those who are 13, meaning they off the clock, and at 16, they ready to be married to Almighty God of law. Because at 16, he a man, and that's all they telling you who the 5% is. So with the Street Academy that's been established here in Newark now, uh, it's under the direction of Raz Baraka, and uh, it's a very beautiful program, man, saving lives. Any chance I get, I come down and aid, my brother, because he's teaching a knowledge of self class down there. They come into the street academy with low uh, reading grade levels, low math grade levels. And when they leave there, they have an 80% graduation rate. They leave there with the high school equivalency diploma. Some of them have went on to college. So this is what a lost vision is, man. You know, staying uh, grounded to the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th degrees and keeping our focus on the youth, you know. And that's what has to be done universally in our nation. You know, when I first used to go to the rallies in the parliaments, there was no standing room. As I just saw, previously spoke to you about the first rally I ever went to in Medina, had to be around 84, 85. Man, I've never seen so many people in the park like that. I'm serious. I mean, it was flooded. The top of the hill all the way down, gods and earths everywhere. Now you go to one of our events, in the tri-state area, it's like the nation is dying, man. And the penalty for not teaching is death. 
And this is what you see going on in our nation. So what has to happen is that there need to be a call to go out at our universal rally or at our universal parliament. And it's a simple solution. The God elevation always bill would be about this. He said, God, the solution is if you're going to come, bring somebody, bring a youth with you. We supposed to teach the uncivilized and keep our eyes focused on the prize, just like the man. If you look at the first nine born, all of them was teenagers. Prince was the oldest. He was 18. What we see going on in our nation is that we went away from that. We took our focus off the youth and kept it on ourselves, whatever it may be, building useful things for self, nation, whatever world you want to conquer. However, the focus has to come back to the youth. So that's what uh, the North Street Academy is focused on, the disengaged youth. And this is what the nation has to become focused on if we want to survive. That's right, brother. So, uh, you know, I was building on the same thing a couple of weeks ago when I was on. I was building about the same thing that we got to come outside. And we got to start building with the youth, you know, we got to. Yeah, it's like a, it's been like a generation gap. Like brothers feel like uh, they're afraid to approach the youth in this damn time. Yeah, you got to understand, you was once that degree, you know, and somebody took a liking into you. Allah didn't just teach them, he mentored them. You got to really keep your word to these young people and lead with love. The reason why the Street Academy has been successful for what I can see, because they lead with love. A lot of them youth come in there, they don't know the meaning of that. The question is asked in some of the classes, uh, raise your hand if you know what love is about. And sometimes you don't see no hands raised. You know, mm. sometimes that's, that's all they asking for, some attention and love. They really want it from their immediate family, sometimes the parent, mom or dad. But, you know, in this day and time, a lot of them come from a broken family structure. You're dealing with a large generation of babies having babies, meaning young parents having children and they're not mature enough to raise them themselves. You know, so what occurs is that you have this demographic of the child wanting the parent, looking up to the parent, and the parent's still young-minded, never really grew up, never really experienced life. They're not really there for the child. I've seen it growing up my all my life, you know, young people being raised by the grandparents, some raised by one, you know, single parent home. It leads to a lot of different situations, you know. So our focus has to remain on our youth, period. You know, our job is to teach all human family civilization teach civilization to all the human family of the planet Earth, yet our focus got to be our own because we lose them at a rapid rate each and every day, dog. So this is why we live righteously, teaching righteousness every day in each and every way, yet our focus has to become more youth-oriented, period. It's the only way our nation going to survive, bro. And Not to go off of the music or anything like that, you know. Yeah. It's very important, God. Also, I want to make knowledge born. I came out as Lakim Shabazz of law. Uh, the label that I was on would not put a law at the end of my name. Aaron Fuchs, uh, this Jewish white man, Tough City Records. However, I took Shabazz out my name back in born understanding, God. My right to my full righteous name is Lakim Sharif Allah. Yet I respect the name Shabazz because that's the name that I made a history for myself in the music industry is that, and a lot of people identify with it. Yeah, when I build with the brothers and sisters in the nation, I make knowledge born to them. A lot of people know and this, some of them don't. You know, so if you are amongst me that. and you get to walk and talk with me, these are things that you will definitely find out. But yeah, back in born understanding, God, I took Shabazz out my name. All right, can you say your name once again? Is La Kim Shariq Allah. That spell love Allah, King our Master, Savior He Allah, rule our King Allah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was back in Born Understanding. Bro. Born Understanding. All right. All right. All right. So now let's segue into the music piece because you know we spoke on the nation, and that was beautifully put, respected. I didn't hear anything that was out of the ordinary, just right and exact. So I want to talk about how'd you get a deal? And if you got knowledge in 83, you were 13. When did you what how you were what like 16 when you got a deal? 17? 
Now, Cypher, I ain't get my deal with Tough City till I was like 20 years old. Also, keep in mind, the knowledge came there, yet I didn't, you know, I didn't master the lessons at that young age. We acquired a copy of 120 through this brother, Jamel, yet I didn't cap 120 till I got my 20s, man. You know, uh, but uh, back to the record deal. I got a deal because uh, when I graduated high school at 18, my cousin Lamel was cool with biz. And uh, he knew I used to rhyme a lot. So he uh, one day he took me to, to biz in Cool V House. They lived out in Elizabeth, New Jersey. He took me over there and biz threw on some beats and I rhymed for biz. He liked it, Vaughn and him liked it. And I stayed with them for maybe about, I'd say for about two years, I was with biz and Vaughn. I probably would have came out under the Juice Crew or with them had he not been working on the Vapors album. At the time he was working on the Vapors album, he didn't really have the time to work on me. And Vaughn felt that I was ready. And uh, so he just connected me with 45 King. The funny thing about that is that uh, I had met 45 King previously before uh, Cool V hooked me up with him. I first met 45 King when I was in, uh, I'd say, the 11th grade to this brother that I used to rap on my block named O.P. He knew that I rhymed too, so he was telling me about this guy, DJ Mark, from New York that lives in Irvington on Stuyvesant. I want to take you to meet him. So he eventually took me to meet uh, DJ Mark, and that happened to be the 45 King. Uh, O.P. took me to Mark's house maybe on two occasions. The second time he took me there, I was totally impressed. When I got in his basement, Tito from the Fearless Four was rhyming. Uh, Tito was killing it too. 45 King was on the turntable spinning instrumentals of friends, and Tito from the Fearless was just killing it. You got to keep in mind, uh, my intro to rap, I've always been attracted to uh, Treacherous Three, Tila Rock, Fearless Four, Cold Crush, all the greats. I grew up listening to all of them. Uh, I used to spend nights in the Bronx when I was 13 with my man Bink at his aunt house. And sometimes me and Bink would go around by Disco Fever just to see some of the artists come in. We was too young to get in. So I grew up Bronx bred with hip hop. I mean, I, I grew up listening to all the classic tapes. Jazzy 5 MCs, Cosmic Force MCs, you name it. I'm familiar with all the Bronx legends. And um, yeah, man, uh, my intro into the getting this record deal in 45 King, back to that. My man OP took me over there. I seen Tito rhyming. That totally impressed me, seeing Tito on the mic. Fast forward, uh, that had to be when I was in around 11th grade. I didn't see 45 King anymore until I actually graduated from high school and I was working with Biz and them. And Vaughn hooked me up with him when I turned maybe 19. I went back to see 45 King. I reminded him uh, I had previously met him. And he asked me, was I still rhyming? I'm like, yeah. He threw on some beats. I rhymed for him. Uh, he called me over there. Two days after that, when I got there, I see uh, Apache was there, Chill Rob G, uh, Double J, and another MC, Lord Ali Bosky. These was all original Flavor Unit members. And I draw it up that Mark had been telling them about me. So when I got there, they put me on the spot. They wanted to hear me rhyme. And I rhyme for them. And the rest is history after that. You know, um, I started working with 45 King. We started doing demos. He started shopping it around. And Tough City was interested in me. And that's how I ended up getting a deal with them, with Tough City Records. All right. Now, let's go. Let's rewind. How did you meet Biz? Did you explain that? Because you... Yeah, my cousin Lamel, the one who sparked me with the knowledge. My cousin Lamel was cool with Biz and Vaughn, and he knew that I rhymed, so he took me over to Biz's house one day, and I ended up oh, kicking it for Biz, and he was impressed. He was like, yo, he sound like a little cane or something, this, that, and the other. And uh, he kept taking me back, and I was actually just rocking with Biz and Cool V for a while. While they was working on the Vapors album, and um, I was eager beaver ready to come out, and Vaughn saw that, and he connected me with 45 King, and I had already previously met him. So once again, once I rhymed for him, rhymed for Apache and all of them, they accepted me, and I just started going over 45 King house, and we would make demos here and there, 
And uh, he eventually shopped it around in New York to a few labels and Tub City showed interest. And that's how I got the deal. Now, 45 King, if you don't know who that is, is he a legendary? He's a legendary producer, right? Yes. DJ and producer. DJ Actually, uh, 45 King used to be the record boy for Funky 4 Plus 1 more in them DJs. Breakout. So I would draw it up a lot of his history with knowing funky beats and 45s is because he used to hand funky four plus one more DJ all of his records, you know. And when they started sampling, doing beats, uh, he was always a technical dude. So um, he was bred in the Bronx. And I think he also lived out in Queens because he's very cool with Davey DMX. And uh, yeah, man, he's just a great guy, man. Great legend at making beats. Definitely. He taught me uh, what the meaning of a kick was, what the meaning of a snare was. If it wasn't for him, I would have never got into producing beats. So, you know, may he rest in power forever. That's my man, 45 King. We put him uh, to rest about two or three months ago. And uh, he's going to always be missed. But we keep him alive. We got some joints we working on. I got a song dedicated to him. I have a whole song dedicated to Apache as well. But yeah, 45 King is a DJ. And producer, he produced uh, "Stand for Eminem." Uh, he still produced Jay Z's uh, biggest single to this day, "Hard Knock Life," and a lot of other stuff. Produced uh, Patchy, myself, Queen Latifah, Chill Rob G. List goes on and on. He's done uh, remixes for Madonna, Lisa Stansfield. Work with a lot of different people. Yes, sir. Now, how was it being around? So, so you were around Queen Latifah, Forty Five King, Apache. How is Apache like? What's his personality like? Because he brought in that energy, like the gangster energy and all that. So he's a wild dude. That's my man, though. <laughs> Apache was a fun dude to be around, man. Definitely. Yeah, he passed on. Good right? brother. Pardon me. He passed on, right? Yeah. The, uh, Apache went home maybe about twelve years ago, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. so Good brother, though. Yeah. yeah. Personality, very outgoing, uh, extroverted individual, love to have fun. Uh, just a tough stand-up dude, man. You know, real stand-up guy. He was like my partner in rhyme. Anytime I rhyme now, I, I, I can still hear Patchy criticizing this world, criticizing this bar, this, that, and the other. Very serious about the rhyme game and flows and things of that nature. But a great dude to be around, definitely. I definitely miss him. Now, what about uh, um, being around Queen Latifah? How was that? Well, she's cool. She was always like our sister or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't spend a lot of time with her. Most of the time when she was around, like mo all of us was there. And we was just like bobbing, you know. Mm -hmm. It was like she was the female, her and Nikki D. Her and Nikki D was the females in the flavor unit. And they were our sisters, so, you know. It was just like a sister vibe. We would go down Mark's basement, he throwing beats, and we all taking turns around it. You know, kicking it, smoking blood, blood or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, all right, so it was all good. 40, 45 King, you got, so, okay, you got your deal. What, I don't know if you want to talk about, like, what kind of contract you had and what kind of. I had a bone contract. I was young, dumb, and full of cum <laughs> in all reality. Now, God, I was an eager beaver. I was one of them individuals that didn't proofread what I was getting into. See, I got sparked with the knowledge yet, you know, uh, it took me some time to grow to understand what I was dealing with. My cousin Lamel sparked me. He could only give me what he had, you know. And if you ain't been taught this properly by someone who's grounded in this culture to actually walk and talk you through this, then you're gonna have a misunderstanding. So for some years I had a misunderstanding. You know, I was taught, my brother told me that Allah said to a great brother named Achman one day. He asked Achman, he said, Achman, are you the true do you know who the true and living God is, or are you the true and living God? And he said, Achman looked back at the father and he told him, he said, Father, I'm the true and living God. And he said, Almighty God, Allah replied, that's why you could leap over 10 five percenters to get the one true and living God. 
Now, I ain't saying nothing about wrong with a five percenter because I have understanding. I understand if you refer to yourself as being a five percenter and I refer and I understand if you say that you are a member of the nation of gods and earth. The best part is understanding. And I look at that in my life because for about 10 years, I was being bounced around with a lot of different five percenters, meeting different brothers until I linked with the true and living God. One that can actually walk me through this and teach me this culture the way it's supposed to be lived out. The first taste I got of a true and living God was a, a, a black seed brother by the name of Born of Law who lived out here in Essex County in Orange, New Jersey. And he was one of the first brothers who was very instrumental in uniting the seeds out here. And, um, and through him and the brothers that he taught is how I began to grow to understand his culture for what it is. And through a brother named Prince Naquan, I met the God Elevation and I've been tight with Elevation ever since. And, uh, and my brother was taught by firstborn Prince, uh, the God Kundalini, he was raised by Jaki, uh, Achman, and a lot of brothers that walk with the father. For, uh, first born ABG too, because when he was with Jaki, ABG used to be with him all the time. So, you know, he was getting it from the best of both worlds, man. And I'm grateful to have been with my brother all of these years. And one of his greatest qualities is his equality. You know, he deals equal in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. So the things that he learned, he has shared them with me. And in return, we I teach it, you know. Now I know and understand, you know, uh, certain principles and things as far as what Allah intended for his youth and what he taught, you know. Yeah, for years, you know, I, I, I held on to what I had. That's why when my album came out, I had what I had, but, you know, I, you know, I didn't really understand what I was dealing with. The understanding comes in time. And Firstborn Prince used to say, man, don't gain no understanding to his understanding at his sight. He ain't 30 years old yet. That's not to say that a man in his 20s don't have no understanding, but take that for what it is. You got to stand under the sight for long enough to see it. You know, mm. I'm grateful that I've been standing under it long enough to see it. Now. Mm. now, I have some questions about, OK, so you got a bum deal, right? You said. Yeah, I had signed a, a, a whack deal, like a lot of us, man. Like a lot of the brothers that was on Wild Pitch, same type of deals. Uh, Gangstar was signed to Wild Pitch. Lord Finessino was signed to Wild Pitch. Uh, who else? Main Source was on Wild Pitch. A lot of people was on Wild Pitch. And uh, Aaron Fuchs was had Tough City. A lot of the greats did music on Tough City. I don't know too many who has not Cold Crush. A lot of people work with Tough City Records. Uh, he's been around for a long time. However, uh, he has a history of being a crook as well. And I didn't proofread the contract. I was just an eager beaver wanting to get out there. And, you know, at the end of the day, I have no regrets. Once I realized that I signed a bum deal, I had to take the legal measures to get up out of that deal. And it took All me right, some no time problem. to get up out of it. I don't mean to cut Pardon you. God? I don't mean to cut your wisdom, but I want to want to I want to get to this part. Now, watch this. Now you got. So you got that bum deal. Is that the, that was the first album? Uh, Pure Righteousness. Mm hmm. 1988. That's what this says. It came out. Right. I didn't realize I had that bum deal until after that second album. Yeah. Both yeah. albums are on Tough City Records. So hold on. So did you get an advance or anything like that? Yeah, I got advances. And as you can see, he flew me to Egypt. I did a video in Egypt and the whole nine, dog. So, you know, he paid for videos and things of that nature. But what made me realize that I had a bum deal was when I started seeing how other artists' videos were coming out, how their labels were treating them, the type of advances that they were getting. And I was looking at how I was being treated at the label that I was on. It was totally, you know, totally messed up. This guy was just totally cheap. Okay. Yet so, at the end of the day, I have no regrets. What I would say is that I am grateful that I did make an album on Tub City because had I not, I wouldn't be doing this interview right now. Regardless of how bad that label was, he did give me the opportunity to get my voice heard. We know sound travels at 1,120 feet per second, and each man in this nation have a sound knowledge of 120. Through that, I spread this culture to all four corners of the planet. 
just like the eight points on our flag to tell you about the distance the truth is capable of traveling from the mouth of our uh, mighty universal sham, God's manifestation. So with that, my wisdom was mean enough to add a cipher, God. And I gave them two albums to the world. And through Tough City Records, even being a bum label, he got me out there to the world. So I'm grateful for that. I have no regrets, you know what I mean? Once I grew to understand the type of situation I was in, I did what I had to do to get away from it. Beautiful. It God. took me some time, but I took a legal route and got up out of it. Right. Now, God, when you got that advance, you were how old? You were 20 years old, right? Yeah, I was only 20. You mm -hmm. were 20 years old, and then you got how much money on the advance? On oh, my advance? Oh, man, my advances was... Man, I don't even want to let you know how much I got. Right, then, don't tell us <laughs> it was so low. It was so low. So now it was so low. I don't even want to mention that, dog. Just know and understand on my on the first album, the budget couldn't have been no more than about maybe 30, 40, 50 grand. And that split between me and the producer. On the second album, it was a little more. All right. All right. So now yeah, the deal that I signed, God, in a nutshell, the deal that I signed. I had signed majority of most of my publishing over to him. So when it comes to royalties on the back end, I didn't really receive anything from him. That's the lifeline right there. That's yeah, the man. Lifeline. You know, that's that's it. And, and unfortunately, a lot of uh, MCs came in the game young. They didn't study the business aspect of it. They had talent. And you'll see some, you know, a lot of these people be looking to leech up off of us. You know, the lessons teach you that they'll use you as a tool and a slave to keep you blind, you know, to the knowledge of yourself. The only way to master the original man is by keeping them blind to the knowledge of himself. So with that said, when you look at these record companies and they got to either be but who's talented, they know that they can make money off of your talent. Yet at the same time, if you are, you know, mindful enough to have an entertainment lawyer going there with you to overlook that paperwork, they'll do that to you, too. You know, they're going to use you for as much as they can. It's not their job to educate you about what you sign, and they just going to slap you with the contract and throw some green at you. And unfortunately, a lot of us come from impoverished areas. You know, we ain't never seen thousands of dollars thrown up in our face like that. A lot of us take it on face value and run with it. I was one of them as well, though. Yet I'm grateful. In time, I grew to understand what I was dealing with, and I did what I had to do to get up. Understood. Now, God, let's talk about this, right? So let's go through the album, uh, Pure Righteousness. That's mm -hmm. one of my favorite songs, God. Thank I, you, God. Appreciate it. I work out to I work out to your albums like every day. <laughs> That's now, peace, God. That's a pleasure and an honor that you do, God. Now, God, great. all of these, all of these, all of these uh, uh, um, titles. Uh, pure righteousness, black is back, black is back. Yo, that's my song. Uh, all true and living. All of these titles, did you create all of these titles? Were you the pen that created all of these titles, the lyrics, everything? Every last one of them, God, because that's where my mind was at at 20 years old. You can hear the lessons, what I had and what I knew, it was balling. And that's what came out. I could have chose to rap about the streets. I had been in the streets. I don't like to address those things because everything is not for everybody. You know, I, I could have rapped about a lot of the uh, the ill things that I've seen in the streets of North. I had people connected to me that was in the drug game heavy, real heavy. I could have chose to rhyme about those things, yet I didn't want to because I was a member of the 5% nation and the teachings was so heavy to me, uh, what I was learning. Keep in mind, one of the things that influenced me to accept uh, that the black man is God was that when Roots came out, I was maybe in the fourth grade, they made us do an essay on Roots. And uh, after watching Roots, I used to go to my grandmother, my mother. I never really could lock my uncles down because they was always moving, busy, this, that, the other. And I would go to my mother, my grandmother, different people, and I would ask them, why did they do that to us? I asked teachers in school, why did they do my ancestors like that? And none of them could answer that question. I never did get a clear answer to that until I acquired English C lesson one. Never got a clear understanding. 
as to why, you know, they did that to us mm -hmm. until I read English C lesson one. Once I got the one to 36, I'm like, oh, this clears that up right there. So what degree in the one to 36 cleared that up for you? Well, I don't look at the one to 36, you know, actually as a degree, because that's to my understanding, that's just a conversation. I think it's the authorities interviewing Prophet W.D. Farr. It's just that uh, the whole thing, you know, the whole conversation and Farr's answers are giving me a clear understanding of why slavery took place and the thing and what happened. You know, it, 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 it gave me answers that my grandmother and my mother and them couldn't give me, you know. Just the fact he say, my name is W.F. Muhammad. I came to the wilderness of North America by myself. Mm -hmm. You know, my uncle was about a trader 379 years ago. He does not talk his own language. He does not know he's my uncle. He likes the devil because the devil gives him nothing. Then the questions start coming, you know, and all of that alleviated a lot for me in reference to roots. No one else could never give me no understanding or explanation as to why that happened. So from that and then just studying, man, you know, knowing that growing with these teachings, knowing that supreme mathematics is a science that studies life in all its variating forms. Once I grew to understand I'm the original man and knowing that knowledge is infinite, I start studying, dog. I'm going to study to the day I die, God. I'm a, it's never going to be a point in my life where I stop studying. I'm not one of them individuals that you come in my kingdom, I pull out my lessons or whatever. They got cobwebs. Nah, God. Mm -hmm. I keep this active because if you don't teach this, if you don't keep it active, you will lose it straight mm -hmm. up. That's a I fact. ran into so many people that say, I used to be I or used I used to. to. And I'd say, well, used to was a rooster. What was will always be. Indeed. Now, God, let's go in, let's go into this, God. The next album, right? So you had uh, Pure Righteousness, 1988. Then you mm -hmm. had uh, the old school flavor of La Kim Shabazz. Is, that was the next one? No, uh, Lost Tribe of Shabazz. The Lost Tribe of Shabazz. So you said two out, right, because you said oh, two out. Right. The first now, one is Pure Righteousness. The second album was called Lost Tribe of Shabazz. All right. Now, now, now peep this. Now, there's a song on this old school flavor of La Kim Shabazz, rare, rare and unreleased old school hip hop. This is an album, right? There's a song called Style is Free. Mm -hmm. You remember that song, of course. Yes. <laughs> that beat, that beat. Who made that beat? My man, Louis Vega. Louis now, Vega from the Lower East Side in Manhattan. He also did the beat for One, Two, Three on Naughty's album. All right, now that same beat was sampled by, I guess, Puffy. No time for fake ones. Just sips of good style. What's up? Remember that song? Right, exactly. Yes. Do you you realize that? You realize that? Yes, I realize that. Oh, yes. All right. And so Vega now, when I first heard it, I was like, "Oh, they jacked it." <laughs> <laughs> but that's cool. It keeps things alive. Like when people sample other people' music. I say it keeps it a lot, literally, because we used to get flack from that from some of the old funk bands and some of the old R&B groups. And you hear it on, um, you know, if you think if you listen to uh, Pete Rock and C.L. Smooth first album, he addressed that a lot. He addressed that over time, you know, through some of his rhymes. How if we didn't, you know, sample y'all shit, you know, some of y'all would be old and forgotten. Nobody would be thinking about you anymore. Be grateful we sampling your shit. We keeping it live. Yet pay homage to them at the same time. See, what a, well, a lot of times where the problem with that comes in is the artists will sample somebody's stuff and not give homage to the individuals that they got it from. Not go through the legal ramifications to find out what publishing company owns it. You may have to clear the sample, so on and so forth. Yeah, this is a thing we're showing respect, you know. But definitely, yeah, I, 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 I heard it. When I when that song first came out, my DJ called me like, "Yo, Lil Kim rhyming to your shit." <laughs> I'm like, "Well, actually, it's a James Brown track, you know, so they could sample it the same way we did. I just happened to use it before them. That's all." Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so now uh, we got two albums. You got Pure Righteousness and uh, The Lost Tribe of Shabazz. Now, I'm looking at the album cover, right? So, and uh, let's go over Pure Righteousness. So now you have a crown on. With it, with with the tassel, and then you have like you know like an African garb on. 
Uh, right. Whose idea was that? Whose idea? That was uh, my idea at that time. I said, I want to wear some uh, cultural African garb. Yeah, I'm going to get it made and I'm going to get my crown. I'm going to get a crown made as well. So you might see somebody in a dashiki, but you ain't going to see them with no combo like that, like that one. No. That I had I had that originally made. I told them to put a tassel on it specifically. You're right, yeah, God. That's why I was like, so, it, so it, it's a crown, you know. It's not like the average, you know, African hookup that you will see. And we had got that made. Uh, they had this spot downtown North that specialized in that. And uh, me and the guard see just if you notice, if you look on the back of the album cover, he has on the same type of um, outfit. He has on a dashiki with a crown as well. With a toss one. Got you. Now let's and that go had on. a lot to do with the um, you know, the state of hip hop in that day and time. Right, know? exactly. The state exactly. of hip hop in that day and time was very Afrocentric. A lot of people chose to wear African medallions instead of gold jewelry. And it was peace, man. It was a very strong, powerful movement going on at that day and time. And I know y'all all done heard the stories of how they had the secret meeting in hip hop and determined that they wasn't going to promote this positive music anymore. So this is when it started to dwindle. You stop hearing Public Enemy on mainstream radio. You stop hearing KRS-One on your mainstream dials. And everything became gangster five. you know? Either you got to flip the brick, or you know, you pimp in the hole, or she got to be shaking her, her privates in front of everybody, or talking about something derogative like that to get up on the air now, you know, and it's sad. It's really sad, man, what they did to the culture. You know, it's like the more money it made, the more that these corporate individuals got involved with it, they took control of it, you know. It's not like, you know, we're not blind to what's going on in the world. A Caucasian man is a scientist. Me and the guard, Elevation, not the golf track, but me and the guard, Elevation, was having a discussion the other day. He said, yeah, Dumar, one time at the parliament, Dumar asked his guard, his brother we know, Supreme Man, he asked him to stand up, he stood up. And he asked him, he said, uh, is the Caucasian man civilized? The Supreme man said, no. So Dumar asked him to sit down and then Dumar went up to him and gave him many different examples of how he is civilized. The Caucasian man is civilized. You know, if you, for, you, for one of us to say you're not civilized, then what about your second degree? In the one to 14, why did Musa have a hard time civilizing him? He civilized it, just Musa had a hard time doing it. And in this day and time, he definitely civilized. You look at America. Shit, the ground we roll, we ride on, all these different skyscrapers, all this technology. So he's definitely civilized. You know, you just got to look at what the meaning of civilized is. One having knowledge, wisdom, understanding, cultural refinement, and was not a savage in the pursuit of happiness. That can apply to him too in his world. We know what it means in the law world manifest. Shit, that man is civilized. You know, hmm. right. definitely. Now, uh, let's go, let's go to. The Lost Tribe of So, uh, so you're naming these albums, right? Yes, Lost Tribe of Shabazz. Right. Now, Lost Tribe of Shabazz, we basically we figured that that part out. Now mm -hmm. you have on the front of the album cover, you're in Egypt, right here. Right, Kenny. Right. As 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 uh, uh the original people would refer to it as Kemet, King Equality, Master Equality, True. Yet we know that the Caucasian man calls it Egypt, just like our God degree, Africa and Asia. You know? yeah. He wants us to think that we're all different. Right. Yet right. the original man and original people are all out in that land. And uh, that's another thing about Tough City. Even though I signed a bomb deal, he paid for that trip. He paid for me to go to Kemet. I was over in Kemet for like a whole week. I went to Luxor. I was in Aswan and I was in Cairo. So the photo that you see on the cover, that's myself and Kemet at one of the, uh, the temples, I think that's in uh, Luxor. Luxor is in the northern region of Kemet or what they call Egypt. Cairo is like the middle region. And Aswan is another name for Nubia, what they would consider the land of the black face. That's mm. the uh, southern part of uh, gotcha. Egypt. But yeah, God, I'm grateful. So, you know, he did do that. Sent me over there and I wanted to do a video over there to show the world some of the beauty of what the original man and original people has done. You know, that's why I'm saying around, uh, look at the things we did with our own bare hands. We built pyramids. 
because even to this day and time, man, they they still using trick knowledge with these ancient alien shows, misguiding people, trying to get them to think that some uh, mystic aliens came down to aid or guide in the building of these structures. But we had a science of everything in life. This is the beauty of what Allah gave us. Knowing that we are supreme mathematical geniuses, the people wonder how that was done. Come on, man, we know how that was done. We mathematical scientists and geniuses. You know, the brothers that constructed them pyramids was in tune with what they wanted to do. They knew how to uh, to move them blocks with hydraulic systems and things of that nature. People think when they see the, the technology of the Caucasian man in this day and time, they think that uh, this is the first time that these technologies have ever been exemplified. Yet you got to understand you're dealing with a father son type of thing. How can a man that's only been on the planet for 6,090 years have more knowledge than you? The original man, he who has no said birth record, no beginning or end. Right. He was older than the sun, moon, and stars. Mm -hmm. and, There's indeed, no way. Indeed, indeed. Let's let's. I want to go into this now. Now, mm -hmm. these. Okay, so your style, your rhyme style, right? Mm -hmm. It's got so many styles. Like I heard Rock Kim in there. You know, I heard I. Like I, I heard Rod Kim. I know I heard Rod Kim. I said this, <laughs> this right here, this song right here, that's right, that's Rod Kim. So now were you influenced by Rod Kim? What are definitely yeah. definitely uh influenced by Rod Kim, Kane, G Rap, LL, all of the greats that came out before me, Houdini, UTFO, list goes on and on, man. Crash crew, you name it. I was influenced by all of the greats, man. With Sean Shit, Jekyll and Hyde, you name it. <laughs> Yo, but but every every line, every song is like it's like complete. Like you're doing that at 2022, right? Yeah, 2021, 22. Yes, God. So, like, what was the process? Did anybody help you? Did you? You just heard no, of not really. Only person that really like, like I said, Apache was always very critical. As far as whenever I rhyme or whatever, I kick something for him. He was the uh, the real critical person, not just with me, with the entire flavor unit. He was like the glue that kept us all together. Actually, Apache, Apache was very critical of your rhymes. He was the only one. Other than that, you know, it was just basically me with the pen work. So after after the two albums, what happened? After them two albums is when I realized the type of deal I signed. And, and that's when that journey began of me getting up out of that contract. It took me about five years. And at that time, I didn't want to do no recordings because I knew what I had uh, got myself involved in. I had to get up out of this contract by any means necessary. So that was at a time when I started delving into producing. I started uh, honing my production skills and I was managing my nephew at the time. He used to dance in a lot of videos, uh, the Young God Shot team. I was managing his career and I had started, uh, you know, doing my, my production thing. This is how I ended up doing something on Diamond D's first album. If you look at the credits on Diamond D first album, I co-produced the song Fuck What You Heard. Mm. That's my man. I met him through 45 King and me and him been tight ever since. I knew Lord Finesse before I met Diamond. Uh, I met Lord Finesse during the time of what they used to have in New York called the New Music Seminar. Finesse was in the rap battle. He knew I was signed to Tough City. I actually met him in Calliope Studios. And this was at a time when he was about to sign to uh, Wild Pitch Records. And he was asking me how things are at Tough City or whatever, and I was telling him, you know, it's cool or whatever. I was still learning, still young, so didn't really realize the type of deal that I had. But I, I was starting to realize that, you know, the money situation, when I was looking at what Tommy Boy was doing for Latifah, and I was looking at what I was getting in Tough City, totally big difference in the treatment of the artist. So, but yeah, um, Diamond D is my man. I, I co-produced on his album, and I started doing beats from that point on. And actually, I still do beats to this day. A lot of people don't know, like, oh, but I still do tracks, yes. 
Nice. I actually produced uh, Need Some Loving on my um, second album. The joint Need Some Loving, I produced that song. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Nice. And you did, and you did all of this like you. Your rhyming is not like a lot of explicit language. Nah, cause I I, I remain righteous. You know, I was uh, mindful of uh, you know who and what I say I am. Being young at that day and time, you know, and and it had a lot to do with what was going on in the world at the day and time. If you notice. On my second album, I got a song called No Justice, No Peace. I addressed three different topics that was happening at that particular day and time, the Tawana Brawley situation, uh, the Yousef Hawkins situation. You know, I had addressed these things. So I was mindful of my audience that I was striving to reach was predominantly black youth. I uh, did a lot of speeches and performances in the, uh, the black college circuit in that day and time. And also, um, I had received the plaque from the mayor of Newark in that day and time, around about 89, 90, because when my album was out, I used to go around to different high schools in Newark and build with the youth, you know, letting them know, building inspiration in them, letting them know I'm from Newark just like you, you know, I made records, I'm with Latifah and them, this, that, and the other, you know, drop a little knowledge on them here and there, and just, you know, strive to plant the seed in them and let them know you could be anything you want to be. As long as you put your mind to it, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, and waste is a terrible thing to mind. That's right. I remember the day you got that award too, God. That was big for the guards, man. Right now, yeah, man. definitely. That was big, man. I remember that day. I'm grateful for that, definitely. Yep. I was presented with a plaque from the mayor North for doing a great job in motivating the young black youth in the high schools in that day and time. And that goes right back into what I uh, plan on doing with my life when I have more time. Like right now, I haven't been to the North Street Academy in quite some time. Like I said, my brother, the guard elevation, he's one of the staff members and he's doing a great job down there. Yeah, he's been asking me for more 5% participation. So I'm gonna start showing back up down there. You know, uh, I've just been going through some things on the family side, relocating, getting myself back situated. Yet uh, that's my thing, man. You know, I'm gonna put out some more music to the world, definitely. They've been asking for that and I need to, because I did two albums. I always tell the people I want to drop another album called The Understanding. And that'll let the world know, let them see what I've been dealing with all these years, how I've been living, so on and so forth. But for the most part with me, man, I'm a family man. I'm grounded in culture. I'm grounded in these teachers. And I'm definitely dedicated to the revival of our nation, man. Our nation has to be revived. Yeah, we strong. We the gods and nerves. Yet when I look at this nation, man, one of the first things I learned was one, two, three. And I was taught that that means knowledge, wisdom, understanding, man, woman, child, sun, moon, and star. So anytime I look at my universal flag, that's what the universe is to me. The universe is the sun, moon, and stars. They're planets. A planet is something that is grown and made from the beginning. You got to be grown to make a planet. And being that you the maker and the owner, the cream of the planet Earth, own up to the things that you make. You know, we born God and we make earth. So if you make a mess out of something, God own up to it. A lot of us don't own up to the shit we do. And the nation as a whole, we got to own up to not teaching these youth. But this is why we see empty seats at our universal parliament. Yeah, if we hold each other accountable and we just, it's a simple solution, yo, God. If you're going to go to the parliament, bring a youth with you. Somebody who's uncivilized that don't have this knowledge. Let me see your magnetic. You supposed to be the piece with the magnetic. One piece had magnetic, one did not. Let's see that you are the piece with the magnetic to bring some youth to the parliament. And we can fill up these seats universally together and make this thing like it used to be when I first used to come here. Mm -hmm. Because right now when we come, man, it's a bunch of men sitting in there. Every now and then you see it, or you ain't seeing no children. And this nation is about sun, moon, and star. You can't build a nation with just men. We need our women, too. So, yeah, God, that's what it's about, though. Mm -hmm.